I have often puzzled and puzzled about what it must be like to go to sleep and never wake up, to be simply not there forever and ever. After all, one has some intimation of this by the interval that separates going to sleep from waking when we don't have any dreams but go to sleep and then suddenly we're there again and in the interim there was nothing and if there was never any end to that interval if the waking up didn't happen that's such a curious thought and yet you know I believe that thou, although that's rather gloomy kind of consideration I found that's one of the most creative thoughts I ever thought in my life. And I keep going back to it. You know, it's in line with a lot of the very fundamental questions that children ask. When they say, Mummy, who would I have been if you had married someone else? These are the kind of questions that make us puzzle profoundly about our existence. And one of the reasons why I think thinking about not being, about total non-existence, is so creative, is that in comparison with that thought, the fact that we are seems kind of queer, incredibly odd. But you know, in the Western world, I suppose we have two dominant ideas about what happens to us when we die. There's the old-fashioned idea that after we die, we go to another world. I say old-fashioned, not to say it's out of date. We don't know what the answer to this is. But that's the traditional answer of the Western world. When you die, you go to another life, maybe heaven, Maybe purgatory, maybe hell, who knows. I think nowadays, though, the more general idea, the more plausible idea to many people, is that when we die, we just cease to be. That's all there is to it. But we're inclined, I think, to have in our minds a picture of this, which indeed is depressing, of being shut up in the dark for always and always and always, to be kind of buried alive in a blackness, where we are blind, deaf, and dumb, but somehow still conscious. But in the Eastern world, there are different ideas of this. The major Eastern idea is what is generally known as reincarnation, of going through life after life after life in an endless series. A process that is represented in this Japanese print of the Wheel of Life, the Buddhist Wheel of Life. This painting was lent to me by Mr. and Mrs. Imamura of Berkeley in California. He used to be the priest of the Berkeley Buddhist Church. And it shows the wheel of stages of existence through which beings pass clutched by the great demon of impermanence. This is rather an unusual representation of the wheel of life. Perhaps some of you have seen these before. They usually have six divisions in the central part of the wheel here. And this one happens to have five. And it's the Chinese-Japanese version of the Buddhist wheel of life. Whereas I think uh, prints in books I know there was one some years ago in Life magazine, usually show the Tibetan version. But what we have here, and I think what I'll do, is I'll explain, to begin with, the popular interpretation of it, and then go on to see what more philosophical Buddhists think of it in a deeper way. These then are the five or sometimes six realms of existence, through which, as I said, uh, beings pass through their various lives. We could start here, for example, this is the human world. 
And then next to this is the world of the devas, D-E-V-A, which we would translate into English as angel. Then this is the world of the animals. This is the world that is sometimes called the hells, only that's not quite a correct term for it. It should be called the world of the purgatories because in this scheme of the universe, there is no everlasting state. There is no everlasting heaven and there is no everlasting hell. The demon of impermanence clutches the whole thing and they all terminate. Next to the hells, there is the realm of what are called pretas, P-R-E-T-A. They are frustrated spirits, sometimes shown with very large stomachs and very tiny mouths, enormous appetite, but very small means of satisfying. And the idea is, you see, that in the course of his development, the individual goes through life after life. If he does well, he ascends towards the heavens. If he does ill, he descends to the hells. Or he may fall from the human state to the animal state, or fall from the human state to the state of the ghosts. But the point that has to be remembered in the Buddhist idea of transmigration or reincarnation is that you can never stop anywhere. You may ascend to heaven, but what goes up must eventually come down. You may descend to hell, but what goes down must eventually come up. And so one goes on and on, moving through these various worlds until in Buddhist ideas you become sufficiently awakened to become a Buddha, one who is released from the wheel and who does not fall anymore into the sequence of rebirths but enters the eternal state of Nirvana. Now if you will look closer again you will see that there are a number of figures round the outside of the wheel and these represent what is called the twelve-fold chain of dependent origination. That is to say, they are a series of links which form what might be called the sequence of life. They are, as it were, a schematic diagram of the force or the process that keeps this wheel rotating. And the chain starts with a demon down at the bottom here who represents ignorance or perhaps unconsciousness the state of not knowing. Then next in order you'll see a potter's wheel and this represents potentialities of life. Next comes a monkey who represents consciousness. A man in a boat. For some reason this represents the combination of name and form. Words bringing out shapes words identifying shapes and things in the world. Here comes sense consciousness, the five senses, a man's body with the senses exposed. And here comes contact, a pair of lovers. After this there comes perception. I am not quite sure what the symbol in this wheel is. Uh, it seems to show a man with a sword behind a screen and two women uh, playing in front of the screen. The usual symbol you find here for perception is uh, a man with an arrow in his eye showing the pain involved in the perception of the world. The next in the link is desire. It shows a woman with twins. The uh, next one here is called grasping and that shows a man with a basket into which he is trying to get the fruits of life. And then as we come over round the wheel, we get a figure which means growth. I think this is one of the gods of prosperity, but it means growth, the fullness of life. Here is birth, a woman in parturition. Here is old age. And then, although the, the final stage of the links of dependent origination as they are usually drawn, shows this one as the last, 
and calls it old age and death. In this particular wheel, they've been spread out so that you get old age, grief, no, excuse me, this is sickness. Old age, sickness, death, grief, compassion, suffering, and again back into ignorance. Here's another figure of ignorance, the camel being led by a blind man. Now, what I want you to notice particularly about this is that the chain represents what is called in Sanskrit the process of karma. I'm going to write that word because it's very fundamental to an understanding of this whole problem. Karma is sometimes understood, and maybe your ordinary dictionaries give it to you, as the law of cause and effect, but actually it comes from the root kri, which in Sanskrit means to act or to do. And the basic idea of karma is that it is action which always involves the necessity for other action. As the Buddha once expressed it, this arises, that becomes. Now this isn't quite the same thing as cause and effect. It is rather the idea of linkage. For example, when I pick up this brush, I lift it by one end, and the other end comes up. Now we could say, this is cause and effect. Although this would be a rather cumbersome way of thinking about it. I could say, for example, that the coming up of the brush at this end is the effect of the cause, my lifting it at this end. But we don't ordinarily think so complicatedly about it. We think in a simpler fashion, namely, that to pick up this end is also to lift up that end because it's all one. So in the same way, Buddhists and Hindus who follow the idea of karma believe that life and death involve each other in the same way that the two ends of the brush, lifting up one involves lifting up the other. So in this way, living involves dying. We wouldn't say that the cause of death is birth, but birth and death go together and they are inseparable. 